My remarks tonight are going to be informal and not at all technical. I'm going to offer a very personal perspective on the events that led to a major overhaul in the college admissions test known as the SAT. The new test will be in place for all students nationwide who must take the SAT as part of the admissions process for college classes entering in the fall of 2006. Hopefully this account will be useful to those among you trying to change policies or practices deeply entrenched in our society. Before I begin, I'd like to introduce a few terms. By the term standardized test, I mean simply a test administered under control conditions and carefully monitored to prevent cheating. I also use the, will use the term aptitude test and achievement test. Achievement tests are designed to measure mastery of a specific subject. In contrast, aptitude tests are designed to predict an individual's ability to profit from a particular type of training or instruction. For example, an algebra test given at the end of a course would be classified as an achievement test, whereas a test given prior to the course designed to predict the student's performance in the algebra course would be classified as an aptitude test. To get a little clarity here, IQ tests are generally thought of as aptitude tests. Something like an advanced placement uh, test that a high school student would take in some specific area like physics or history or the like would be viewed as an achievement test. <clears throat> After World War II, most colleges and universities in the United States gradually adopted standardized tests as part of the admissions process. The test that was most widely adopted was the Scholastic Aptitude Test, the Scholastic Aptitude Test known as the SAT. Some schools use the American College Testing Program, what's called the ACT test, but most institutions, particularly the more selective ones, chose the SAT. The College Board, and that's the nonprofit organization that owns the SAT, the College Board has made a series of changes in the test since its inception. The original SAT became the SAT-1, that's a Roman numeral one, the SAT-1, a three-hour test that continued to focus on verbal aptitude but added a quantitative section covering mathematical topics typically taught in grades one through eight. In addition, the College Board developed a series of one-hour SAT-2 tests designed to measure a student's achievement in specific subjects such as physics, history, chemistry, mathematics, writing, foreign language, and the like. Most colleges and universities require just the SAT-1 in the admissions process, but a few colleges require the SAT-1 plus two or three SAT-2 tests. So let me just get a few terms clear here. We've got the College Board, the owners of the SAT. The original SAT over the years has developed into what's called the SAT-1, very much like the original SAT-1 aptitude test, and then a series of SAT-2 tests that some colleges will opt for students to take one or two or three of those tests. When the SAT is mentioned in the popular press, the reference is invariably to the SAT-1. The SAT-1 has become a key factor in determining who's admitted and, I should add, who is rejected at the more selective institutions. My concerns about the SAT date back to my years as a college student at the University of Chicago in the late 1940s. 
Many of the Chicago faculty were outspoken critics of the SAT and regarded it as nothing more than a multiple choice version of an IQ test. They argued vigorously for achievement tests in the college admissions process. Their opposition may have been influenced to some degree by school rivalry. The leading force behind the SAT at that time was James B. Conant, the president of Harvard University. Eventually, Chicago adopted the SAT, but not without controversy. In the years after leaving the University of Chicago, I followed the debate about the SAT and IQ testing with great interest. I knew that uh, Carl Brigham, a psychologist at Princeton who created the original SAT, modeled the test after earlier IQ tests and regarded it as a true measure of innate mental ability. But years later, he expressed doubts about the validity of the SAT and worried that preparing for the tests distorted the educational experience of high school students. Harvard's President Conant also, serious, also expressed serious reservations about the test later in his life. I knew both Dick Hernstein at Harvard and Art Jensen at UC Berkeley personally and kept track of their controversial work on IQ testing. Uh, Dick Hernstein was the first author of the famous book, The Bell Curve, and uh, Art Jensen, a long-term professor at Berkeley, uh, was notorious uh, in the 1960s for his collaborative work with the Nobel laureate Shockley, uh, arguing that there were racial differences in intelligence. And of course, I was a long-term member of the faculty at Stanford University, where the Stanford Binet intelligence test was developed. Over the years, my views about IQ testing proved to be mixed. In the hands of a trained clinician, Tests like the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scales are useful instruments in diagnosing learning problems. They can often identify someone with potential who, for whatever reason, is failing to live up to that potential. However, such tests do not have the necessary validity or reliability to justify ranking individuals of normal intelligence, let alone to make fine judgments about highly talented individuals. My views are similar to those of Alfred Binet, the French psychologist who, in 1908, at the turn of the last century, devised the first IQ tests. Binet, in his writings, was very clear that these tests could be useful in a clinical setting, but rejected that they, the idea that they provided a meaningful measure of mental ability that could be used to rank order individuals. Unfortunately, Binet's perspective was soon forgotten as the IQ testing industry burst onto the scene. So much for my personal history before I became seriously involved in the SAT. My involvement began in the 1990s when I served as chair of BOTA. And I'm sorry about that acronym. acronym. BOTA, B-O-T-A, the Board on Testing and Assessment. The BODE is a board of the National Research Council. The three academies uh, of the United States, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine are charged by the Congress to provide advice uh, to the federal government, to the various agencies of the federal government on scientific issues that uh, face those agencies. And the three academies have under them what's called the National Research Council, and its responsibility is to conduct the necessary studies to provide that advice. National Research Council is made up of, oh, 30 or, oh, probably 80 different boards and advisory committees, and they take on different uh, uh, issues that uh, relate to the government and have a scientific base. BOTA has been in existence for 10 years uh, as part of the National Research Council, and it has done a marvelous job of integrating and interpreting research findings as they relate to issues of testing an assessment in the United States government. Uh, they've uh, focused on the State Department's uh, tests for career diplomats. They've been responsible for 
reviewing and judging the civil service exams for fairness. Uh, they uh, just now are fussing with uh, a new test that, uh, citizen, that potential citizens of the United States will have to take, that is a naturalization test. So BOTA has been a, a very remarkable organization. And my, while serving on BOTA, I, my attention became focused on college admissions testing. However, the defining moment for me occurred at a meeting of BOTA in Washington, D.C., when representatives of the College Board presented their views on college admissions tests. I left that meeting less than satisfied. The College Board has a superb record, both on the technical aspects of test development and on administering tests and ensuring their security. But at the meeting, the notion that the SAT-1 was a true measure of intelligence dominated their perspective. On my way home, I stopped in Florida to visit my grandchildren. I found my granddaughter, then in seventh grade, already diligently preparing for the SAT by testing herself on long lists of verbal analogies. She had a corpus of quite obscure words to memorize, and then she proceeded to construct verbal analogies using the words. I was amazed at the amount of time and effort involved, all in anticipation of the SAT. Was this how I wanted my granddaughter to spend her study time? Now, I assume most of you know what I mean by a verbal analogy. It's something that dominated uh, the early SATs and certainly was a major part of the SAT-1. Uh, it's usually a group of four words. Uh, for example, lawyer is the client, as doctor is, and then a blank, and the student will have a multiple choice selection. And hopefully in that list would be uh, uh, patient, so it would be lawyer as the client, as doctor as the patient. But there were a lot better examples than that. Uh, on the plane trip uh, back to California, I drafted an op-ed piece about college admissions. It was not focused on the University of California, but on college admissions in general. It made a series of points. One was that college admissions tests should not try to measure innate intelligence, whatever that is but should focus on achievement, what the students actually learn during the high school years. In addition, such tests should have an essay component requiring the student to produce an actual writing sample. And the test should cover more mathematics than simply an eighth grade introduction to algebra. And finally, I said that an important aspect of the admissions tests was to convey to students, as well as their teachers and parents, the importance of learning to write and the necessity of mastering at least 8th through 10th grade mathematics. I'm going to go off on a tangent here for a minute, but let me say the op-ed uh, piece was handwritten uh, on an airplane, as I said, and although I shared it with a, close, a few close friends, uh, it was not ready to see the light of day. But later, when the SAT controversy erupted, a reporter learned of the draft of the op-ed and requested it under the Freedom of Information Act. To my chagrin, the UC, the University of California General Counsel, declared that it was a university document and had to be turned over to the reporter. I tell this to you as a warning uh, to all of you in the future. <laughs> Later, when I was asked to give the keynote address at the annual meeting of the American Council on Education, I'll be referring to that as the ACE, the American Council on Education, in February of 2001, a colleague of mine at the Office of the President, a man named Pat Hayashi, suggested that we use the op-ed draft as the basis for the speech. Uh, the American Council on Education is the principal uh, national uh, organization for colleges and uh, universities. It uh, turns out uh, very important conventions. And so the, the notion of uh, speaking there was something that was appealing to me. And Pat's suggestion appealed to me. I might add, Pat Hayashi was the long-term admissions officer at the University of California at Berkeley. He was reg regarded as quite an expert on issues of admission. 
And it was interesting that at that very moment in time, he was a, he was a member of the Board of Trustees of the uh, College Board. Although as uh, UC president, I already had plenty of controversies to contend with, I liked Pat's suggestion and we proceeded to redo the op-ed piece, but this time focused on the University of California. In a nutshell, I said that I intended to recommend to the faculty that the university cease using the SAT-1 and rely on only the SAT-2 achievement tests until an appropriate achievement-oriented test could be developed to replace the SAT-1. The text of that speech was a closely held secret. I shared it with only a few trusted colleagues. I flew to Washington, D.C. on a Friday with the speech scheduled for Sunday afternoon. I checked into my hotel Friday evening. The next morning I woke up planning to spend an enjoyable Saturday visiting the Hirshhorn Gallery. When I opened my hotel door, there in the hallway was the Washington Post. The front page story, top of the fold, headline read, UC President Calls to Abolish College Testing. I uh, rushed out to retrieve copies of the LA Times and the Chicago Tribune and found the same thing, front page stories. The New York Times had a long story also starting on the front page, which was particularly interesting to me because uh, they had reproduced word for word almost half of the speech. To say the least, I was uh, stunned. Again, I'm going to go on a diversion here, but I think it's interesting. I'll take a moment to explain how this happened. A young man uh, in the University of California press office was about to take another job, and he had friends at the Associated Press. The computer system in my office was not as secure as we'd assumed, and he was able to obtain the next to last draft of the speech. I know that it was the next to last draft because at the very last moment, Pat Hayashi, the gentleman I referred to earlier, convinced me to add a paragraph uh, to the speech on comprehensive review, namely that the university should stress the importance not just of test scores and grades, but of multiple factors in the admissions process. So I said to Pat, okay, draft a paragraph and put it in, and he did. When I saw the paragraph, I was satisfied with what he had to say, but he'd used the term holistic review. I disliked the word holistic with its various connotations and quickly changed it to comprehensive review. But the New York Times carried the term holistic because they had the penultimate draft of the speech. That term, holistic, continues to plague me even to this day. <laughs> Apparently, some people still refer to the original New York Times account. I never made it to the Hirshhorn on Saturday. Most of the day was spent uh, dodging reporters and frantic calls from UC officials, regents, and otherwise. When I arrived at the AC meeting on Sunday afternoon, the auditorium was packed, as were the overflow rooms. The place was alive with reporters. There were TV cameras and satellite feeds everywhere. It was a truly chaotic scene. The president of the AC was absolutely delighted this was the biggest crowd and the most media coverage ACE had ever had. No one seemed disturbed that the speech had been leaked to the press the day before. The, audience, the audience's response was wonderful. I had expected to attract some attention in the higher education community, but I was unprepared for the general public's response. Clearly, the topic hit a deep chord in the American psyche. Over the course of the next several months, I received hundreds of letters from people describing their experiences with the SAT. I was on the News Hour with Jim Lehrer. I was in a debate on Good Morning America, the major magazines such as Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report had cover stories. The one I liked best was the Time Magazine. They devoted a large part of an issue to the subject of college admissions testing. Nick Lehman, a reporter who authored a, what I consider to be a very important book entitled The Big Test, The Secret History of American Meritocracy. Uh, Nick Lehman, who, who authored this book, The Big Test, 
wrote one of the Time Magazine articles that I particularly liked. The piece included a photograph of me on one page, and facing me on the opposite page is the President of the United States, George W. Bush. The question over the photos is, what do these two men have in common? Lehman's answer was that we both supported the idea of standardized testing. This was just shortly uh, before, the, that is my speech was just a few days before President Bush gave his first major uh, national speech, first major address to the nation, and that's when he unveiled his plan for K through 12 education, no child uh, shall be left behind, and of course he emphasized the importance of standardized tests at certain points. So uh, Lehman's answer was that uh, we both supported the idea of uh, standardized testing. A few clever souls speculated that what the two of us had in common was the same SAT score. Fortunately, I was able to respond, no, that's not the case. I was a student at the University of Chicago, which at that time had its own entrance exam, and it certainly wasn't the SAT. Some people assumed that I was arguing for no testing at all. They hadn't bothered to read the actual speech. For a few weeks, anti-testing groups saw me as a hero until they realized that I was not proposing a ban on standardized testing. Unfortunately, in one of the discussions with reporters, I described the impact of my granddaughter's experience on my thinking, and after that, she was often mentioned in their stories. She was truly embarrassed by the whole thing and was not too happy with her grandfather. I'll return to her views on this matter in a minute. The College Board's response to my speech was less than enthusiastic. There were some sharp exchanges in the press, and a number of SAT supporters wrote scathing articles. A few of those articles got a little too personal. Some of the articles were written by admissions officers who failed to disclose that they were paid consultants to the College Board. And efforts were made to enlist key faculty, again as paid consultants to the College Board, to oppose the proposal. But as I will explain later, the College Board did, in the end, agree to totally overhaul the SAT. The president of the College Board, Gaston Caperton, deserves much of the credit for what took place. He'd served as the governor of West Virginia, and in that role had been particularly effective in improving K-12 through education. I might add, he'd only been president of the College Board about a year or so when the controversy arose, and he was not deeply immersed himself in the whole issue of testing. As the, as the SAT debate evolved, he showed remarkable leadership. Some of the senior people at the College Board wanted to maintain the status quo, but as Caperton immersed himself in the issue, his perspective changed, and he concluded, that a major overhaul of the test was needed. I admire Gaston Caperton greatly. He showed courage and leadership, and the forthcoming changes in the SAT would not have occurred without his involvement. Earlier, I mentioned that my colleague, uh, Pat Hayashi, who was uh, really my collaborator in a lot of this, happened to also at that time be on the board of the College Board. He was one of the members of the advisory board of the College Board. He played an interesting role in all of this. At one time, the board thought he should leave the room when there was a discussion about these topics, but uh, there was quite a debate about that. He insisted on being in the room, and I think that was an interesting aspect of it all. Buried in the ACE speech was a brief paragraph uh, that was overlooked by most people. It noted that the University of California had used the SAT, one, and three SAT2 tests for a number of years, and that several small-scale UC studies indicated that the SAT2, te the SAT2 tests, that is the achievement tests, were a better predictor of college performance than the SAT1. Just a brief paragraph, hardly noticed, but it was a ticking time bomb. Now I have to give you a little University of California history. The University of California, under the university's tradition of shared governance, 
have res the, the UC faculty under the university's tradition of shared governance have responsibility for the admissions process. Shared governance is a concept that was invented at the University of California. This was invented uh, in the early 1920s. We were the first university to develop anything like the concept of shared governance. The idea was that in certain aspect of the university's activities, the regents, the administration, and the faculty should share in responsibility uh, for that activity. And uh, many years ago, over 50 years ago, the regents of the university delegated to the faculty the authority to uh, uh, handle the admissions uh, process. Now, the responsibility uh, of the UC faculty in exercising this uh, uh, responsibility is in the what's called the Board on Admissions and Relations with Schools, another acronym, BORS, B-O-A-R-S. I always say BORS, it takes me minutes to remember what it stands for. BORS is the committee of the UC faculty responsible for the admissions process. In 1960, over 40 years ago, when many universities in the country had already adopted the old SAT, uh, Bohr's launched a study where the University of California had not adopted the SAT as late as 1960. Bohr's launched a study to compare the SAT and several achievement tests that Bohr's itself had devised as predictors of college performance. This was long before the SAT morphed into the SAT-1 and these many SAT-2 achievement tests. Uh, the results of their study was mixed. The achievement tests proved to be more useful predictors of success at the University of California than, the, than did the SAT-1, but the benefits of both tests, at least to the faculty at that time, appeared marginal. Bohr's decided not to introduce admissions tests and to continue relying on high school grades. In 1968, the University of California began requiring the SAT-1 and three SAT-2 achievement tests. However, the applicant's SAT scores were not considered in the regular admissions process. Rather, high, SA score, high SAT scores were a way of admitting promising students whose high school grade record in certain required courses fell below the UC standard. So we didn't really, if you were a good student, it didn't matter what your SAT scores were. If you were a poor high school student and you had unusually high SAT scores, that was a basis for admission to the University of California. Uh, that was the UC faculty's view in 1968, and I think an interesting one. Lehman, the person I referred to before in his book, The Big Test, asserts, and I think it's true, that uh, when the University of California adopted the SAT, that was a turning point for the College Board. Uh, to this day, uh, more students, and it was true then, to this day, more students apply to UC, more students applying to UC take the SAT than at any other university in the country. By 1979, UC faced increasing enrollment pressures. And, of course, we also have faced the issue of grade inflation in the high schools. And so, at that, by 1979, the university finally adopted the SAT as a formal part, a formal part of the regular admissions process. That year, Bohr's established, and here we go with more technical detail, but that year, Bohr's established what's called the UC Eligibility Index. It's a sliding scale that combines high school grades with the SAT-1 score to determine whether a student is eligible. Under the Master Plan for Higher Education in the State of California, the University of California is to accept the top 12.5% of high school graduates, uh, not, by high, not high school by high school, but by the state as a whole. And with the enrollment pressures, uh, that eligibility index was set up, and it was an eligibility index that used the high school grades of the student, 
plus their SAT 1 score. It did not use their SAT 2 scores. Uh, and I say it's a sliding scale because if you had very high grades, the SAT 1 would play a very small part, but as your grades fell down, higher SAT scores would help raise your chances of admission. I want you to note that the faculty at that time chose to use just the SAT 1 score in the uh, eligibility index. They did not use the SAT 2 scores. Now, the University of California has many campuses, or, or at least three campuses, that are highly selective, Berkeley, UCLA, and San Diego, which means it's very hard to get in. Every eligible student will be admitted, or at least until this year, every eligible student will be admitted to one campus of the University of California, but there'll be no guarantee that they'll be admitted to their campus of choice, and thus the admissions officers at individual campuses will use the full array of data, including the SAT scores, in making uh, the individual campus decisions. So that's where we were from 1979 to 1995. In 1995, shortly, before, shortly after I became president, Bohr's, that is the UC faculty, with my strong endorsement, redefined the eligibility index to include high school grades plus scores on the SAT-1 plus scores on the three SAT-2s. Redefining the, redefining the eligibility index was done on the basis of several small-scale studies suggesting that SAT-2 tests were good predictors of college success. So in 1995, the word went out to high school students, their parents, and uh, their counselors that the SAT-2 tests had taken on a new significance. And let me tell you that when the University of California makes a choice, makes changes of this sort, the word does get out. The high school counselors are very alert. And so students quickly began to realize that, yes, the SAT-1 was important, but the SAT-2s were not that important. Uh, that, that the SAT-1s, which the SAT-1 is important, but the SAT-2s, which before had not been important in determining eligibility, took on a very special meaning starting in 1995. By the time I gave my ACE speech, we had four years of data under the new policy on all freshmen who were admitted and sub subsequently enrolled at a University of California campus. We had approximately 78,000 student protocols. A student protocol included the student's high school grades, the SAT-1 score, the three SAT-2 scores, family income, family educational background, the quality of the high school the student attended, the race, ethnicity of the student, and several other variables. And of course, the protocol also included the grade record of the student in his or her freshman year at a UC campus. When I gave my ACE speech, an analysis of our data had just begun. However, a few months later, we, went, we were able to complete the analysis. It examined the effectiveness of high school grades and various combinations of SAT-1 and SAT-2 scores in predicting success in college. A full account of the study has been published in the Journal of Educational Assessment, and it's also available on the website. I might say that the entire data record, all 78,000 protocols without student identification, is also available on uh, the web, and dozens of researchers all over the world are reworking that data in a dozen different ways. It's campus by campus, uh, major by major, just about any breakdown you can think of uh, when one can, can sort through that data and study the relationship of all these variables and, and how they predict the performance of a student uh, as a freshman in the University of California. In brief, the study shows that the SAT-2 is a far better predictor of college grades than the SAT-1. 
the combination of high school grades plus the three SAT2 scores, account, and this is, bear with me, account for 22.2% of the variance in first year college grades. When the SAT1 is added to the combination of high school grades in the SAT2, the explained variance increases from 22.2% percent to 22.3 percent, a trivial increment. Let me say that whenever you add something, you have to get an improvement, and to go from 22.2 to 22.3 is just sort of hard to believe that it can be so minimal. When I was first shown these data, I really began to wonder if uh, the analysts were just trying to please the pres president of the university. They were just too remarkable in terms of uh, the speech that I'd given. The data also indicated that the predicted validity of the SAT-2 is much less affected by differences in socioeconomic background than is the SAT-1. After controlling for family income and parents' education, the predictive power of the SAT-2 is undiminished, whereas the relationship between SAT-1 scores and UC grades virtually disappears. Put another way, if you know uh, the uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, background of the uh, student, the, uh, it, the adding the SAT-1 score doesn't help you a lot in predicting their performance in college. On the other hand, if you know their SAT-2 score, uh, its, uh, its predictive power is undiminished by knowing the student's uh, uh, family background. The data yield another interesting result. Of the various tests, the best single predictor of student performance was the SAT2 writing test. This is one of the SAT2 tests that the University of California requires. And it literally requires a student to write a brief essay. Uh, it was, by far and away, of any individual test, the best predictor uh, of uh, college performance. And I don't think any of us should be too surprised since uh, uh, writing skills, I think, should and do play an important role in uh, college. There are a lot of additional analyses that I could go through. Uh, it's, this is just not the place. It's a little too technical. But uh, there has never been a study quite like this. The size of the database is quite remarkable and the ability to analyze uh, the results in so many different ways is also uh, quite remarkable. And one has to wonder, given that these tests have been around for so long, that there hadn't been a real careful study uh, up until this time. Once our data analysis was made public, uh, opposition to a change in the SAT-1 quickly died out. And the UC faculty was fully engaged in planning for a new admissions test. In March of 2002, just a little over a month uh, beyond a year after I gave my ACE speech, Gaston Caperton, in his role as president of the College Board, announced that they would eliminate the SAT-1 as, as it then stood and replace it on a national basis with a new test very much in accord with my original proposal and the planning that the UC faculty had already done. My wife told me I should not make this remark, and I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to. I can't resist. Uh, at the time that the speech was leaked and all of the stories were in the press, the reporters got a hold of a lot of college presidents for their views on the speech. And most college presidents were wise enough not to say anything. In fact, I don't think I saw any college president quoted. But one former college president was quoted in the New York Times story, and I can't resist injecting it. Uh, the reporter, after, and I won't just mention who it was, but the reporter said to him, well, you know, what about this? And he said, well, the and this is how it reads in the paper, well, the University of California may decide to drop the SAT. But I assure you that Harvard will not drop the SAT. <laughs> Rita, should I have not said that? Uh, since then, the College Board has uh, been consulting with UC faculty and other groups around the country about the new test. The test that is now being developed includes a 25-minute 
essay requiring students to produce an actual writing sample. I consider this extremely important. A more substantial mathematics session, mathematics session, section assessing higher level mathematical skills and a reading comprehension section that does not, I'm pleased to say, include verbal analogies. I believe this is an ideal solution that reflects the changes that I called for in my ACE speech. UC's plan, UC plans to use the new SAT-1 and to continue augmenting it with possibly two or possibly three SAT-2 tests, although the faculty is still, I think, debating that issue. When I look, uh, debating whether it would be two or three SAT-2 tests. When I look back, I'm amazed at the speed with which change has occurred. The, AC speech, the ACE speech was in February 2001. The College Board made its decision to overhaul the SAT-1 in March of 2002. The new test is now being field tested and will be in use for students entering college in the fall of 2006. In a very brief time, uh, brief certainly by academic standards, college admissions will have undergone a revolutionary change, a change that will affect literally millions and millions of young people. My granddaughter, returning to my granddaughter, my granddaughter is a sophomore in high school this year. She will be in the first group of high school students to take the new SAT-1. Last month, she took the PSAT, and this is a test preparatory that the College Board has. It's preparatory for students who will then go on to take the uh, new, the, the uh, old SAT-1. And she did brilliantly on the PSAT, which would say that she'd do brilliantly on the uh, old SAT-1. And uh, she's uh, not quite sure she likes the fact that things are being changed so uh, radically. Uh, her uh, high school, I might add, has already taken note of the impending change and now has the students writing a 25-minute essay in class once a week in preparation for the new test. In fact, that's going on around the country. Suddenly, high school students are starting to write and with a clear uh, goal in mind. One of the lessons of history is that colleges and universities, through their admissions requirements, strongly influence what's taught in grades K through 12. From my viewpoint, the most important reason for changing the SAT is to send a clear message to K through 12 students, their teachers and parents, that learning to write and mastering a solid background in mathematics is of critical importance. The changes that are being made in the SAT go a long way toward accomplishing that goal. Uh, my question is uh, two parts. Um, I was wondering at what point in time the, the UC also began accepting the ACT exam as an alternative to the SAT-1. And I was wondering if you have a, uh, some comments on the predictive, predictive validity for the ACT versus the SAT-1. Uh, well, first of all, the ACT evolved in the Midwest at the time uh, James Conant and others were pushing forward on the ACT, I mean on the SAT. And it was really a Midwestern response uh, to an Eastern response. The Midwestern response is that it should be more achievement oriented. But they drifted into the same mode over time. And the ACT is principally used in the Midwestern universities. I think in most of the East and most of the West, uh, and certainly in the prestigious universities, the SAT is the dominant uh, factor. The uh, University of California will accept the ACT in place of the SAT, but very few students will take the SAT, uh, the, the ACT. Uh, I mean, I would point out that most universities, for example, start Stanford, only require the SAT-1. And so the fact that UC has required both the SAT-1 and the three SAT-2s is make, makes us somewhat unique. 
And the reliability and validity of the ACT, I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, based, first of all, they don't have the kind of study that we were able to mount. Uh, no, no one really has the kind of study that we were able to mount. But I would, again, I would say what's important from my view is to send a message to students which, oh, by the way, the ACT now has decided to add a writing component to its test. And so I would say that's a good step for the ACT. Uh, in some respects, I like the, the ACT better than the SAT, but I, there's enough that I don't like about it that I wouldn't want to use it. But I think the fact that they've added a writing component is extremely important. And so every student now is going to have to think twice about learning to write uh, in preparation to going to college. If I understand you correctly, you've said essentially that the SAT as an aptitude test has now been replaced by the SAT as an achievement test. And my question is, can you help us understand the tremendous grip that the SAT as an aptitude test has had on our imaginations for at least 50 years. You know, that's why you want to read uh, Nick Lehman's book, The uh, Big Test. I mean, that will give you a, a good, uh, you know, go ahead, get back to the microphone. You might help me here. <laughs> uh, uh, that will give you a good uh, count. You know, let me explain that Conant's original idea was a very good idea. Conant, when he first pursued the SAT, wanted to transform Harvard from a school that just accepted students principally from uh, the private schools in the East. Now, the SAT in its original origins was an achievement test. There was an almost well-defined curriculum over the set of private schools in the East, and they went through that curriculum in fixed order, and the SAT was an achievement test to determine how much they learned. But Conan's view, and I think a very good one, was that students out in the Midwest, out in South Dakota, wouldn't have access to the kind of curriculum that uh, these students had in the private schools in the East, and the way that somehow using a test like this would identify those students. And that was in the heyday of IQ testing, when people really thought that they had a technology in hand that would uh, allow you to measure mental ability in some sharply defined sense. Why did it sweep the nation? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think there are multiple reasons. Go ahead. Um, uh, I mean, what you're really saying is that this was a fiction. And I'm not convinced that uh, the use of the SAT as a talent spotting device was fictional. Well, I don't know what you mean by talent, uh, 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 it, oh, IQ. I mean, you know. I mean, that is what we're after in our colleges, really, I think. Uh, I'm not. I'm interested in knowing what a student has achieved who's had an opportunity to achieve. And most students now go to high schools where at least they have an opportunity to cover the basic material. If they don't, we're willing to, you know, take account of that. Uh, but the idea that one can make fine discriminations of a score of 115 or a score of Oh, I don't know, what is this, 550 versus 580 on the SAT as a basis for uh, separating students worries me. Let me say the following. I was a faculty member for many years at Stanford, and in the graduate programs, we had the GREs. And I'm not going to say whether I like the GREs or don't like them. But I, as I look back on that experience, I'm really distressed by the fact that when we looked at students, we, too, we put so much focus on the GRE because we were so anxious to show that our department had the high average uh, GRE score and so forth. And uh, I'm somewhat embarrassed by that. And I think universities that have overemphasized these types of tests have made, a, have made a terrible mistake. And I think a lot of people have been seriously harmed by uh, these, these types of tests because they end up really believing that they're inferior. Uh, I mean, I had one of the letters that I received that I you know, might have mentioned was from a young woman who was a honors graduate from 
the University of California, went on to uh, receive a law degree at Harvard University, went in to interview with a firm, and the first thing they asked was, what was your SAT score? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm quite serious. I mean, you know, people carry that around uh, for the rest of their life, believing that it's a meaningful measure of their innate ability. That's absolutely true. I appreciate your comments. I had a question about the um, grading of the essays. As a parent in the trenches, what can you tell us about the standardization of grading 78,000 essays? Fascinating. You know, it's more than 78,000 in millions. Now, that's just the University of California. Uh, no, millions of essays. Well, first of all, it wouldn't have been possible in an earlier age. I mean, the age of the internet makes it possible. So I think a lot of people who had a different view about testing 30 years ago or so just couldn't implement that view on a national basis. How is it, implement, how is it going to be implemented in the, this period? Literally, each uh, student's essay will become uh, a bitmap in, on the internet. And by that, I mean it'll be sort of a Xerox copy of the essay. Uh, uh, of course, the student's identity will not be known and you won't have access to it. But there will literally be thousands of graders distributed around the country who will access that essay on the internet. Each essay will be graded by two or three people. The essay will, the, the uh, graders, uh, if they don't fall within a certain interval of each other, then there will be additional graders and graders over time will have to acclimate so that their standards uh, for grading are well understood. So it can be done that way. Now, what are the factors that uh, the graders will use? Uh, well, the Kaplan Testing Service is hot at work on trying to advise people on what to do. The, uh, uh, the Atlantic Monthly had a long story about what students should do to perform well. Uh, I, I think you have to go to one of those sources. Uh, I think a good essay, well written, will uh, do the trick. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, college education is to economic strata as intelligence is to environment. B, inheritance. Is that a verbal analogy? Primary education. So, Could you help me with that analogy? You, well, you say it again. <laughs> I'm uh, college admissions is to economic strata as intelligence is to environment, to inheritance, to primary education opportunity. Say a little more. What's your fit sense? What are you saying to me? Well, I'm just wondering how you would answer that analogy. It seems to me that regardless of how we slice this onion, we keep ending up with maybe the same kids ending up in the same place in the process. And how do, how do we expand that process to really get to a, a greater spectrum, to really identify the, the kids who don't start out in the, in, 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 the, in the right place? Well, I think one of the most frustrating aspects of uh, the SAT for underrepresented kids, poor kids, was that they never knew quite what to do, how to prepare for it. Now I think it's going to be very clear. I mean, preparation will help. If you understand 8th through 10th grade mathematics, you're going to do better. If you can write an essay uh, reasonably well, you're going to do better. But at least the student will know uh, what's expected of them. And so, now, will this make a difference in the admission of minority students uh, to the universities of the country? We've done that analysis on our data, and that's a complicated story. Basically, I doubt if it will help immediately, but I don't think it will hurt immediately either. That is, underrepresented students, minority students, do just as well on the SAT twos as they do on the SAT one. But I think over time, uh, students who are exposed to a less satisfactory education will nevertheless uh, begin to realize that it's important to write and important to do mathematics and really focus uh, on those issues. I will assure you of this. Uh, this is a friend of mine who's a Nobel laureate and uh, he's uh, from Germany who came here uh, just before World War II. Brilliant career. 
he complains, complained to me all the time that his kids and his wife could always do the verbal analogy, analogies on these tests so well and he could do them so poorly. Yet he spoke the English language beautifully and was very elegant. I really believe that English as a second language is a problem in terms of the subtleties of some of these types of verbal analogies. And so I think students who have English as a second language uh, will be able to do better over time than uh, they would have if they, we had stayed with the old SAT-1. I guess this question, you started to answer this question before I asked it. Um, my question relates to the new SAT, and I think I understood what you said about the sensitivity of the SAT-1 compared to the SAT-2 on socioeconomic status. And I'm curious what the new SAT, is what kind of validation or testing we at the University of California are going to be doing. Well, you've got the chair of BOTA here in the room, so maybe she'll maybe answer. Maybe we that. could ask that person. Yeah. But uh, what, are, what are we going to do to make sure that we don't just end well, up? I will, I mean, you, you can be assured the University of California will track these things very carefully, and they are working very closely uh, with, uh, with the College Board in the development of these tests and the ongoing analysis of the data that uh, flows from them. But I think, uh, you know, it would have been very hard for the University of California to go its own in this area. I mean, there is a, there's merit in a national test. Uh, I mean, the student who applies to Stanford and the student who applies to UC Berkeley, you know, are taking the same test. And uh, it makes life, if we each, in the old days, you know, each university had its own admissions test and it got too chaotic. And obviously, no one knew what the tests were testing either because they, they didn't have the database to analyze it. So nationalized testing of this sort I think is important. We've got to be careful not to place too much weight on the tests, and we've got to be very careful not to believe that a score of 145 makes you brighter than someone with a score of 140. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so ends my odyssey with the SAT. I thank you very much.